Today we're very pleased to be interviewing California State Senator Sheila Kuehl. Before Senator Kuehl was elected to the California Senate in November of 2000, she served three very distinguished terms in the California Assembly. She was Rookie of the Year in 1995 and went up to being Speaker Pro Tem 1997-98, the first woman in California to hold that position and finally to chair uh, the Assembly Judiciary Committee. Senator Kuehl was also the first openly lesbian or gay person elected to the California State Legislature. Sheila Kuehl's impressive leadership brought California citizens reform of the state's failed child support system, uh, pro-consumer reforms of the HMOs, and increased civil rights and worker protection. Sheila Kuehl has worked for more than 30 years to ensure that all Californians have access to violence-free homes, an excellent standard of health care over the course of all their lives, a clean environment, and equal access to legal protection and benefits. Since there's still work to do in all of these issues, we're very happy to report that Senator Kuehl's life motto is, I do, therefore, <laughs> I am. Today, Sheila, we hope to explore some of your reflections on what you've done, as well as on what you think still needs doing. So welcome, Sheila Kuehl. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Well, thank you for agreeing to be with us. You bet. We'd like to start at the beginning um, with your background, uh, the kinds of things that you would single out now. Looking back at your life, you became a state legislator. Before that, you were a lawyer. Before that, you were an actor. All these different careers that you've had. When you look back at your background and growing up, can you talk about some of those formative influences, whether it was parents, sure. neighbors, friends, whatever? Well, it's interesting that job in the legislature is the first job I've had that I feel uses me up entirely every week. Uh -huh. uh, everything that I have that is... Uh, you know, a useful tool in my life, my education, even my acting, um, you know, caring about people, being able to talk, um, whatever. It all is brought together in this job in a way that is so compelling. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles, uh, mm -hmm. working class family. Others would have said poor, I guess, but uh -huh. working poor. And I uh, went to public schools. I went to UCLA at a time when uh, it was $58 a semester. There was a real commitment in California to making certain that if you had a high enough GPA from mm -hmm. your high school, you could go to uh, any public university uh, in California. And I was the first person in my family anywhere ever to go to college. Uh, my mother and father finished the eighth grade. My mother was orphaned uh, at the age of 11 and went to work in a garment factory. So we had um, grew up in an atmosphere in L.A. where uh, we were very grateful to be, we, we thought it was middle class, but of course, you know, it was working poor. Mm -hmm. And um, my sister and I, fortunately, were in an extremely safe home and a loving wow. home, which really empowered you enormously. And while I was at college, I volunteered as a counselor in a camp for underprivileged children. And the, you ask about formative experiences. Um, as an actress, you don't really think very much about other people. You don't know that you're not thinking about other people, but it's a very, very selfish environment. Mm -hmm. And at this camp, which actually was run by the University Religious Conference at UCLA, and of course we didn't know it as counselors, we thought the camp was for the children and their enjoyment. But the University Religious Conference was made up of all of the pastors or whatever, you know, the ministry to UCLA, the different faiths. Their mission really was to develop us as students, mm -hmm. uh, our moral and ethical development. And so the experience of counseling with underprivileged or blind children was, was sort of done in a way to have us get something out of it, not mm -hmm. just do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I jokingly say that that's what ruined me for ever making a fortune, because <laughs> it was so wonderful. I was so struck by how wonderful it was to do something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think I was just captured from that point on by a sense of, I don't know, uh, that you've got to do something about injustice. And uh, I continued to act, and then I, my career fell apart when they found out I was gay. 
Mm. Uh, and I really didn't know what to do. So I went back to work at UCLA in the University Religious Conference as a switchboard operator. And then eventually worked um, in the office at UCLA that advised student organizations. By now it's about 1960. Nine. Mm -hmm. So I was given to advise the SDS, the Progressive Labor Party, the <laughs> Women's Liberation Front, the Black Student Union, and METCHA. None of them wanted any <laughs> advice in 1969. And, but they did start coming around my apartment mm -hmm. late at night to talk mm -hmm. about justice and injustice, to talk about revolution mm -hmm. and theory, to talk about community, uh, to talk about poverty, to talk about everything that was on their minds, and eventually to talk about the war. Mm -hmm. um, and it really galvanized my own sense of thinking, gee, maybe I ought to do more about my own education. I got my BA, women in my generation, certainly in my class, rarely did anything after college, but you know, get married, etc. I was an English major. Me too. It was a perfect thing we to go did. to law school <laughs> from, you yeah. know, I mean, really. Um, and so my, uh, my students actually encouraged me to think about going to law school because they were going to go to law school to try to see if they could fix up some of the injustice mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And I knew, you know, they said, look, no woman's ever going to be chancellor at UCLA. You're not going to get promoted, like, amazingly. While I was at UCLA, I became a feminist, mm -hmm. uh, partly for my students, and then realized that people in middle management like me, associate deans of students, were not getting any of those promotions that the guys were getting. Mm -hmm. And that was another reason I decided that I might want to go to law school, because mm -hmm. the you know, you don't join the women's movement, it comes and gets you, and kind of, it did. So in the early 70s, I decided to go to law school, and I applied to UCLA, and I was turned down, and I was devastated. So it was kind of the second time in my life that something fell apart, you know, with my so active career. So you just career. had to go to Harvard. Well, it was interesting because I didn't know what the problem was. I had graduated in the top 10% of my class in 1962 with a 2-9 overall. During the Vietnam War, Grade inflation pushed all college oh. grades up almost an entire point. Because nobody wanted to send the guys off mm -hmm. to fight. So the Fs became Ds right. and the Ds yeah, became Cs. Sure. But I was devastated when I was turned down at UCLA. That was my home, my alma mater. And I only tell the story because it's sort of like, I'm sure a lot of people's stories are like this, where you think that it's all over. Hmm. You know, that you've just failed at something. And if you just look for the other door or answer it when there's a knock. Sometimes, you know, your guardian angel will have something a little better mm -hmm. in mind for you. And this guy that I worked with gave me uh, a report on great inflation at UCLA, and it said, here's your 2-9, but it's worth a 3-8. Here, send this report off and apply to some other law schools. So I got into Harvard, I got into Yale, I got into Bolt, and I was turned down again at UCLA. Huh. But this That's time, incredible I sent them a letter with all my, you know, my acceptances and I said, I think it. you've got a problem. And, of course, I said, and this is a problem that you're discriminating against women because it's women who, in my generation, uh -huh. who deferred going to graduate school. And if you're not going to count our grades correctly, then, you know, I wasn't a lawyer yet, but I was already beginning to sound like one. So I chose to go to Harvard and had a wonderful time, won the moot court competition, because as I'm sure you can already tell, I can talk. And um, How many women were in your class then? Well, they were almost 25, 25 were 26% by then. Okay. By then. This okay. was started in 75, graduated in 78. Mm -hmm. So the increase had started after 1968. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's almost double. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost 50%, even mm -hmm. at Harvard. But the interesting thing to me at Harvard was that our graduating year, 78, mm -hmm would be the 25th anniversary of the graduation of the first women from Harvard. Amy Brenneman's mother, Freddie mm -hmm. Brenneman, was in that first class. A number of Charlotte Armstrong, who actually uh -huh. was the president of the Board of Overseers at Harvard and, yes. you know, quite prominent in And her, you've uh, gone on to be on, that, that should be noted for the record. That I'm on the Board of <laughs> Overseers. I even got to serve while she was the chair. Oh. But um, while I was a student, I decided we needed a celebration of those women and all women who'd ever gone to Harvard. So I chaired, in my third year as a student there, I chaired Celebration 25. And since then, we've had Celebration 35, Celebration 40, Celebration 45, oh, and in 2003, we'll have Celebration 50. Right. Um, we commissioned a portrait of the first 12 women to graduate. It was mm. So everywhere I've gone, I've tried to draw um, instruction and mentoring you know, from women who've gone before. 
uh, and I guess really to pass it on. I mean, you see, you see myself as a different kind of sandwich generation. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. those who went before, I want you to tell me everything I need to know, mm -hmm. and those who come after, I'd like to share what I do know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was our keynote speaker at that very first conference, and since I was the chair, I, you know, I got to actually sit at her table for dinner, and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> I mean, what a mind. She was the keynote speaker at Rutgers New Law School dedication, and she was wonderful. She is extraordinary, an extraordinary mind. I mean, I met Thurgood Marshall because he was the chief judge at our moot court, mm -hmm. and her, and I think those are two of the most extraordinary minutes, you know, and I will say minutes, because, you know, <laughs> it's not hours you get to spend with such people really in incredible heroes mm -hmm. that you just have to understand their stories and you can say, well, I could probably never be that good, but at least I can try. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important. She was in there from the beginning. I actually had the good fortune of meeting her in the early 70s when mm -hmm. she was, long before she was on the Supreme Court. And she was always such a strong, clear advocate of women's rights and in the but, law, in the context of the law, and always so thorough and so earnest. And well, not genteel. only earnest, but um, mm -hmm. genteel uh, to the extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a woman of, um, I don't even, I felt like she was a throwback to an older time, mm -hmm. where uh, women would cross that, well, I guess what we would call gentlemanly mm -hmm. approach, if you know what mm -hmm. I mean. Um, she, she, it's not ever uh, not apparent. That's a double negative. It's uh -huh. always apparent that she's a major intellect, but the genteel nature of her uh, sort of approach in the world, uh, it's not just a woman thing, you know yes. what I mean? It's really like an old-fashioned respect that she pays to everyone. And that, I think, was also a very, very good lesson to me from a few people when I got into the legislature, because I was elected um, in 94, and as the country went to the right, mm -hmm. so did California. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in over 25 years, we had a Republican majority in the state assembly in California, but it wasn't your father's Republicans. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, in California, very, very conservative, Christian fundamentalists, for the most part, that were swept in and in leadership. And so I needed all the genteelness, you know, in the minority, you really do have to kind of do that, um, that I could possibly muster just to get anything through. And in addition to being the first gay person ever there, I thought, you know, what if they shoot me or something? But it all turned out quite different. Would you, as long as we're up to the legislature, and we'll go back and do some other things uh, before your life in the legislature, but I do want to take an opportunity while we're on camera to have you tell that story that you told at the COP conference a few years ago. I can't remember, it wasn't one of the huge conferences, it was the smaller conference. And it was how you dealt with, in the legislature, um, the gay issue and the woman. It's, it's a great story about how you also can work in a bipartisan atmosphere and with a sense of humor and with men. Well, of course, if you ask me what issues. joke I told yesterday, I won't even remember. <laughs> so to remember what I may have said. But I do have, as we all do, uh, a kind of a set of standard stories. I don't know that I really remember my life anymore. <laughs> what I remember are my stories yes, about my life. Always. And I think these are the way you know, uh -huh. it happened. But there were a number of things, really. Um, first of all, I, when I first went into the Democratic caucus, I really didn't know what would meet me, although there were a number of people I worked with on battered women's issues, which is really kind of what got me uh, interested, partly at least, in, uh, in addition to uh, the conference in 92, in running for office. And I walked into the Democratic caucus, and Marguerite Archie Hudson, an African-American woman, and Kevin Murray, an African-American man, and Antonio Villarregosa, and Barbara Friedman, and John Vasconcellos, John Burton, I mean a real mix of Democrats, came up to me and said, okay, we don't want you to have to eat lunch by yourself, so we're the honorary gay caucus. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I thought, oh, thank God, you know, thank God, at least they'll be, I mean, I knew uh, that they were not going to ostracize me, but I just didn't know, you know, I mean, when you're the first anything, you really don't know. And there was this enormous, well, what should we say, there was this very strong and strange homophobe uh, named David Knowles, who
who was a uh, representative at the time, a, an assembly member, who the year before I got there had made this long speech against one of the gay rights bills, hmm. a modest one brought by my predecessor, actually, um, and he, in which he had read from books and pamphlets and detailed all of this disgusting gay sexual practice, which he seemed to be enjoying enormously reading to everyone. And it, I just thought, you know, this is going to be devastating. I mean, I don't know. So my first day on the floor, I went right up to him and I said, look, uh, I'm going to shake your hand. It's, an, it's not catching. So, uh -huh. And we're going to have to work together. So, you know, we can either be enemies mm -hmm. or we can work together. It'll be up to you. And he was totally flabbergasted. Um, but an interesting man, uh, you mm -hmm. know, and we actually did end up working together. Uh, but I think the story you're referring to is um, the, the man who's now actually the Republican leader in the Senate was the Republican leader in the Assembly, Jim Brulte. And he's a man who is a large man. And I had an office with a glass door that went out to a patio, and the desk faced the glass door. And early in the first couple of weeks, I was kind of working at my desk, and this shadow fell across uh -huh. my desk. And I looked up, and there's Jim Brulte standing in the glass door. And we had actually spent, a number of us, several late-night sessions working out a new set of rules because we had an equally divided house. Mm -hmm. We had 40 Democrats and 40 Republicans, and we needed some new rules. So we had been working together with various of his guys, and Willie Brown had appointed me as a freshman to be on that negotiating team. So I open the glass door, and Brulte walks in, and he says, I just want to ask you something. If you're gay, how come all my guys like you so much? And I said, well, Jim, that's what discrimination is for. It demonizes the truly fabulous. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I have found, as you said, Ruth, that um, a sense of humor, a little no, self-deprecating no. but not undermining yourself, yes. really helps. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the guys use that, mm -hmm. you know? A lot now, was that them. something that was with you from a child or... Oh, as, yeah. yeah. I was such an entertainer. Um, while we were still living in this area where I grew up, uh, a, a guy came around signing everybody up for tap dancing lessons and, you know, whatever at this school. I was about seven years old, I guess. And we used to take the streetcar and go for these lessons and drama classes, which are really just skits at that age. Mm -hmm. And one night we did a skit in which I ruined the play by being funny instead of doing the serious <laughs> thing. But the owner of the school liked that, sent me out on an interview for a radio show. So I got this radio show, I got an agent, and pretty soon I went on an uh, interview and was cast in Trouble with Father, which was a, the very first uh, film television series you're in uh, 1950, 1950 to 56. And so I was an actress uh, from the age of nine uh, in, co in, you know, in, I guess what we would call sitcoms now, right. but, or I believe they're called episodic comedies now, because we like to get away from sitcoms. Um, did it take over your life as a child, participating in those regular sitcoms? Oh, absolutely. It, yeah, uh -huh. yeah it, it, it was a profession. Uh -huh. But contrary to what people think, where they think you're so oppressed, to me it was fun. It was uh -huh. almost as though they were creating the most amazing playground. And when you're the only kid at the studio, as I was, um, you know, you get to go to school with a, I had a wonderful studio teacher who was... <laughs> it was just one of these fabulous women. One day she came in and she was just singing and bubbling, beautiful woman. And um, I was about 10 and I said, Mrs. Ray, what? you seem very happy today. And she said, darling, God really knew what he was doing when he invented sex. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. You know, I was sort of like, okay, see all the positive influences? You, know, you, you remember can... that. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> you bet. Love absolutely. <laughs> And how long were you on Dobie Gillis? What? Dobie Gillis ran for four years, but the um, at the end of the third year, I did a pilot for my own show, mm -hmm. a spin-off pilot starring my character, Zelda Gilroy. And the s president of CBS scotched the show when they mm -hmm. found out I was gay, or they mm -hmm. suspected it mm -hmm. or something. And I was deeply, deeply in the closet, I thought. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was devastating. I mean, I thought everything is over. And of course, my mm -hmm. career essentially was pretty much over. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, this is so much better. But who knew at the time? It just seemed like a terrible tragedy. <coughs> and frankly, it, you know, it is a tragedy. 
And people say, oh, it's so different now. You know, you can be gay and it's just fine. But well, it's really not true. There are so many people still really afraid, really afraid. Well, hearing your account at the panel the other day of the young people who are so grateful that you're there for them and being public for them on this issue and enabling them to come out was very moving. And that's now. <laughs> well, you know, the empowerment model is probably the most effective thing I've ever seen. And, you know, people, you can't give people power exactly, but you can kind of help them mm -hmm. organize or... Uh, learn to use what they have and together they probably have more power you know than individually. Sure. Well, what do you mean when you say the empowerment? Model? Well when I got out of law school right. um, the first year when I was back one of my one of the women who used to work for me at UCLA before I had gone to law school was one of the founders of the Sojourn Shelter for Battered Women in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. And it was the second shelter actually in the state of California. First one was opened by AA years before but there was no consciousness about domestic violence. This was just the beginning of that growing consciousness that so many women were living in violent families. And she came to me and said, you know, will you help us raise some money for this shelter? And I said, sure. And I chaired, actually, the resource board for that shelter for 15 years before mm -hmm. I ran for office. And the model of the shelter really was, it wasn't enough just to have a safe house. What you needed to do was to give women some tools so that they could help to save themselves as well because they weren't going to be in the shelter longer than six weeks. And I know that this is a model that you use, and it's totally appropriate to ask me what I mean by it. Um, but it's a model that we see in community organizing, a model that we see in lots of women's groups where we're not just talking about giving somebody something, but about helping them to build something in the community out of which they can run forever. And I think it's a really, really important model because it's not charity. It's really about systemic change and helping people engage in systemic change. And that's what the Battered Women's Movement did. I mean, training judges, demanding that the law change. That's how I actually got involved in thinking about running for office was um, I was suddenly raising, trying to raise money, and we're talking a thousand dollars the first year, you know, I mean, from the Christmas card list. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, the shelter workers would call me and say, well, this woman's got to go to court. Can they make her go to court? She's not safe. Or, my God, they just took her children away because she couldn't talk. She was so mm -hmm. scared. Didn't they understand that he was very intimidating, you know? Can't, there's no law about this. And there mm -hmm. was not even a criminal law in California in the mid-70s about battering. Mm -hmm. So I became engaged with just a few other women in California and then in the rest of the country. There was uh, a small cadre of women, actually, Barbara Hart from Pennsylvania, uh, Debbie Tucker from Texas, you know, a number of um, theoreticians and some attorneys, some of us were attorneys, who began meeting to try to think our way through how the law could protect battered women and their children and mm -hmm. kind of grow it around the various states and communicate uh, with people in the various mm -hmm. states. Mm -hmm. Very fledgling, very grassroots. A number of lesbians were actually involved. And I think it was a problem early on between the traditional women's movement and the battered women's movement. There was quite a divide. Domestic violence was not embraced as a uh, serious problem in the mainstream, in the mainstream uh -huh. feminist movement. Hmm. Uh, and my theory was that they were so worried about being labeled as lesbians in those days in the mainstream women's movement mm -hmm. that they were very reluctant mm -hmm. to join in with those of us who were working on what was essentially seen at the time as a very radical issue. Having, inviting women to leave their families, to mm -hmm. take their children and run. You know, this was different from getting onto the corporate board or mm -hmm. things that I also believe was, was important, mm -hmm. but there was quite a divide in those days. And I tell you, it was fun to work in the battered women's movement. We'd say, wasn't it depressing? Mm -hmm. I said, you know, we were doing such wonderful work. It was depressing because women were in danger. You know, it was depressing because it was so slow. But the personally, mm -hmm. the work was not depressing. It was mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I'm interested, Sheila, in um, actually 
a little bit about how you conceptualize about the changes in women's lives. I mean, we all are talking about that and at this conference that we're all attending now. Uh, yesterday, we, as you know, we spent some time talking about whether women really are interested in choosing leadership and how they relate to power and so forth. And we've come to some pretty sophisticated questions and um, a kind of a new level of questions. But when I think back, you said feminism, you don't go after feminism, it finds you. I think is not quite how you phrased it, but something like that. Mm -hmm. When you talked about all those groups walking into your office when you were an administrator mm -hmm. back in the 60s. Um, and all of those groups and all of the social movements, uh, the civil rights movement, the peace movement, women, gay and lesbian movement, all of them were what the second half of the 20th century really in this country did for democracy right. and in a way, I hope, uh, contributes to the world. Right. But there is a difference, isn't there, among them. In other words, the stakes are different, or the challenges are different, the outcomes are different, the root problems maybe are different, not all, notwithstanding shared oppressions and shared problems. How would, what is your thinking about the women's part of this? I mean, the changes for women's lives over the last 30 years. Do you think we've made progress that's good and healthy for humanity? Do you think that we've learned some very important things that help us to be better people in the human community. What's your thinking about it? Well, it's, I, I've been a little ambivalent about giving too much credit to the women's movement, but mm -hmm. I, honestly, my, my own feeling is that feminism as a world view is a transformational view. That it seriously transforms everything it touches. Um, because it, it is the very initial form of dualism that we see in the world. Uh, when anyone has a baby, the first question, it's usually the only question anyone asks them, is not, did you have a boy or a girl? I mean, the, the story of gender is so buried in the question, they just say, what'd you have? Mm -hmm. What'd you have? And everybody knows what that question means. Right. Now, if you were a Martian anthropologist, and you said, you know, the first question asked of a human life must be a really important thing. Because they don't even say, does it have ten fingers and ten toes? I mean, maybe the parents are concerned about that, first of all. Look at what's happening in Japan at the moment. How much hinges on what that child's going to be, a boy or a girl. And no one knows. I mean, it's front page news that no one knows yet what it's going to be, but how different it would be if it were a girl. Mm -hmm. That there would be such a struggle in a society about you know, a, a, a young woman being the, the emperor of Japan. Um, it would be extraordinary, they say, or, or lead to chaos. So if gender is that kind of divide, why is it the question that everyone asks? Just a general old habit? And I don't believe in habit as a Martian anthropologist. I think it all things mean something. So in that sense, the identification of the different treatment of men and women in society, coupled with the initial work done by the civil rights movement talking about race in America, mm -hmm. I think has helped people to understand that there must be something deeply important to every country in the world to saying, I'm better, you're worse. You know, Ursula K. Le Guin said, same and different are wonderful words. They can be friendship words. They can be learning words. Mm -hmm. The killing words are better and worse. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is what those divisions are about. And it's been very, very instructive. Now, what the women's movement has done with the theory of feminism has been different in many ways. Um, it's some of the movements, the people of color movement, and which we call the civil rights movement, but I would you know, incorporate all peoples of color in that. Um, the movement about people with disabilities, uh, to some extent the gay and lesbian movement, has in a way divided also along um, lines as to whether one would consider oneself progressive or sort of moderate, even in those movements. Mm -hmm. Where you're progressive, I think the difference is you think about the economic concerns and the economic divides. A lot of people in the women's movement, as we've gone along, have not been talking about mm -hmm. um, the problem of women keep having the lowest paid jobs, etc. There's been much more focus on equity issues mm -hmm. 
at, you know, at every level. And I'm not a Marxist, and I've never been a Marxist, but I've come to believe that looking at the issue of survival economics and the growing gap between the haves and have-nots in this country since 1980, and the growing homelessness in this country since 1980, you know, I don't blame it all on Ronald Reagan, but there is an enormous line drawn there. Because mm -hmm. the Ocean Park Community Center that was the umbrella organization of this Sojourn Shelter, and which uh, the board that I chaired for several years, sponsors all the homeless shelters as well on the west side of LA. And we got to know when you saw your first homeless family coming along, or your first battered women's family that was homeless because of that. And things changed in the last 20 years of the 20th century. And the poor became even poorer. And of course the rich became enormously, enormously, enormously richer, mostly in this country. Um, and now I think we, we're a little bit at a loss on how to use our lessons about these things in the world, because Americans know very little about the world. And I have to say, I think Californians are to America as Americans are to the rest of the world. We look around the women in this conference. They seem to know our governor's name. We don't know their governor's names. Mm -hmm. They seem to know our energy crisis. Uh -huh. We, and, you know, I read the New York Times, and they never say very much about California, but they seem to know more about us than we know about them. We had this discussion among mm -hmm. California women last night, and we felt just as stupid about Ohio or West Virginia as America now feels about the Middle East mm -hmm. or Kosovo or anywhere else that we don't pay much attention, you know, to those countries. And just lately when Gray Davis made the announcement and decided to tell about the bridges, you know, we were all cheering, well, good for him that he did that. We do hear about California a lot. <laughs> well, and in a way, California is a place that sucks up a lot of resources and generates them and is a rich state, mm -hmm. you know, and has, I mean, we had a hundred billion dollar state budget last year. Now, it won't be quite that high this year, but... I mean, compared to other states' budgets, it's just amazing. Uh -huh. Compared to countries. Yes, Many exactly. Yes. Well, we went from number seven to number six to number five, the fifth largest economy in the world, uh -huh. the state of California. Uh -huh. We may go down to number six again this year. but So I think that the lessons of the women's movement uh -huh. and of other movements are very instructive, but the struggles at the macro level, if you will, at the in the legislatures, uh -huh are very much the same. Mm. Who will we protect? Who will we listen to? Yes, and when I was reading about the priorities that you named, I think quite recently, actually, Sheila, you were talking about from where you sit, the number one issue is education. And then there's all of the health issues and all of the environmental issues. And again, those of us who have been watching women in politics all of these years say, here are the issues, yet again, that the women are almost having to speak up about. And I think there are more men there now, but women are still taking the lead in those issues. It's true, and I okay. see the same thing in the Senate. I see the same thing. You know, if you're talking about child care, I mean, the women in the legislature in California held up the state budget last year because they, we didn't have enough in there for child care. And we finally just said, mm -hmm. you know, screw it. We're going to hold up the budget. We're not going to be good girls. But it was only one thing, and so much sure. was needed. Um, yes, they are our issues. I, I honestly think that women will continue to grow in leadership. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've broken glass ceilings sort of one at a time. But I don't know how much we sustain our succession the way men do. Everyone takes for granted. I mean, having a man in any leadership position is the default position. And if you manage to have a woman who can be elected majority leader in her house, as the woman in New Mexico is, and others, you know, or speaker, or um, president pro tem of the Senate, you may not have a woman succeed her. Mm -hmm. Although now we see in our seats that we may have women that we bring along to succeed Well, us. I know you've deliberately done that. You've gone out and found women to run for the legislature, Absolutely. which is not unique, but it's unusual, and it's a major, I think, a major activity that you ought to spread the word around about well, outside of California. However, too. as individual members, we're not really encouraged by our speaker to go out and find candidates. Mm -hmm. That's no, what they no. do in, 
you know, leadership, leadership. that's what the majority leader yeah. is supposed to do, or the political arm, or whatever. Um, they may not be sexist, but they may not think the woman is the strongest candidate, and mm -hmm. therefore you don't, they don't necessarily want us to encourage, mm -hmm. you know, a contested primary where resources are spent. And sometimes we have to just say, you know, this woman is stronger than you think. She needs a chance in the primary. Of course she's going to battle it out with the guys. And if she wins, you have to support her, and I'm going to help her win. So, but sometimes you really are not that popular with your leadership if you do, you know, they've got some guy in mind, and yes. you've got some gal in mind, and you may not agree. How did you make it happen? I know one woman stood up at a conference and said, "That's I'm here in the legislature because it's Actually, two of them stood up at that same microphone. At the same session. Right. Well, they give me too much credit. But, you know, you have to encourage people. I mean, Jackie Goldberg was already in the city council. She'd been in the uh, uh, Board of Education. But she didn't really want to be away from her family and travel. Mm -hmm. And I had to tell her, y you're right. It's not always fun, especially since she's also a lesbian, and had to sit through hours of calumny, I mean, that yeah. that uh, when we had a bill up that eventually did pass, but a number of our Republican members literally bring their Bibles onto the floor, and, you know, and mm -hmm. thump their Bibles, and so it was not pleasant for her. But I said, look, you won't believe the good you can do. Um. And she said, oh, I had a terrible time this year. And I said, well, how many bills did you start out? She said, 14. I said, how many did the governor sign? She said, Ten. Oh. Like she hadn't thought about it, you know. So mm -hmm. it's a question of whether you're willing to suffer through some of that garbage right. in well, order you know, to, you know, get it through. And I, right. I want there to be more women there. At the at that same session of the of the conference, mm -hmm. uh, there was a woman who got up and said, you know, she has these achieving daughters who wouldn't dream of going into politics. And I'm wondering about this next generation that's coming along. Your generation, the pioneering generation, in many ways, has taken a lot. Um, and you're tough, you know? And a lot of the younger women who are coming along are saying, is it really worth it? And in her case, personally, the daughters had seen what the mother went through. Yes, but the daughters are vice presidents of corporations. And you know a generation ago, everybody was saying, that's really Fair tough. Fair enough. Only a few people are going to want to put in those shoulder pads and go However, home. a young woman could say, it's easier to be a vice president of a corporation and... I don't think they know. I just started reading Kane right. River. Uh -huh. Have you read it? No. It's a, it, well, it was a woman who what? was a fairly highly placed executive at Sun Microsystems. Uh -huh. And she was... This is, a, this is a memoir or a fiction? It's a fictional memoir. Uh, a fictional memoir, uh -huh. there you go. <laughs> she was interested in and then unable to stop thinking about and then obsessed with her great-grandmother, grandmother, mother, and back, who she thought were slaves. Mm -hmm. She's an African-American woman. And she said it, she thought it would be hard for her to quit her very high-paying job at Sun Microsystems. She was very happy there. She loved going to work. She'd mm -hmm. buy this and sell this and <laughs> change this and do this. But she said, I just had to do this and left and spent years researching her family and writing about this small area, Cane River in Louisiana, where her family had been uh, slaves and then freed and then, you know, the generations. And it's fiction only, she calls it fiction, only because she wrote it as a fiction to fill in the gaps of what she was able to find uh, in two uh -huh. years of research. It's true, the people are true. But who knows if they wore a calico dress to the mm -hmm. dance, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Right. So in that sense, right. it's fiction. Right. So I don't know if they're, if these two daughters, mm -hmm. in their maturity, will say, oh my god, mm -hmm. uh, nobody ever said on, their, bad here. <laughs> nobody said, ever said on their deathbed, gee, I wish I'd spent another day at the office. <laughs> However, I might say, gee, I wish I'd spent mm -hmm. another day in the legislature. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on what they see. We can't make it look like fun, but we could, certainly can show the joy that we experience in mm -hmm. doing good work or trying to do mm -hmm. good work. Nobody ever said you have to get all your bills signed in order to be a, you know, a, a great role model. Sometimes the bills that I bring that don't get through are ones that um, people remember, trying to keep radioactive waste from being you know, trucked through the state. Mm -hmm. I haven't succeeded yet. Um, trying to keep the Catholic hospitals from getting 
loan money mm -hmm. and bond money when they won't provide any women's reproductive yes. health services haven't succeeded yet. Well, is it true, it may be true that disproportionately some of these issues that you take on, the tougher issues, when I heard a, a woman saying, you know, term limits are a bad thing because people are unwilling to take on those tough issues. They look at the time string and they say, no, I don't think so. What, what's your sense of all of that? Does it disproportionately hurt women with ambitions because they're taking on tougher issues? No. no they're the heroes. Mm. Um, it depends on how you want to be remembered and what you consider effective. I've had 83 bills signed into law by a Republican governor and a Democratic governor. And some of them have been small, but not to the battered women who had uh, longer, you know, temporary restraining orders or something because of it, uh -huh. or can't be stalked anymore because mm -hmm. of it. Um, and, but they were considered small or reasonable kind of bills, uh, or a big bill that takes, you know, three or four sessions to get through, like my bill protecting gay students, or my bill saying you have to know where the water's coming from before you build a great big development, mm -hmm. um, which is a very big issue here in the West. Yeah. And I think it depends on the individual personality of the woman mm -hmm. elected. I don't believe there's any way to characterize. We've got, just as with the men, mm -hmm. we've got our cowards, mm -hmm. and we've got our brave people. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the cowards are not respected. Uh, they are not thought to be truthful because they won't t they'll tell you, oh, I'm okay on your bill, and then they vote against you. Or, oh, they say, well, my district, they all called me, and I can't do it now. Well, they're toast, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, in terms of their reputation. I, on the other hand, was chosen by my colleagues and everybody else, I hope this doesn't sound like bragging, in 98 and again in 2000 by the press, lobbyists, my colleagues, and staff in votes as the assembly member with the most intelligence and the most integrity. So now, integrity, think about it. I'm a progressive, gay mm -hmm. woman legislator who brings very tough bills. But that is considered integrity. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other kind of example I think we have to set for women, especially, coming into the legislature. Uh, but the other woman who spoke, Beth Jackson, is also not a shrinking violet that I you uh -huh. know, encouraged to come in. And they don't say to me, can you guarantee that I'm going to get my bills signed? Mm -hmm. You know, they say, do you think I'll be able to do any good? And I say to them, yes. And sometimes you don't necessarily only do good by getting your bills signed. Sometimes you do good by being a voice for the voiceless, um, for standing up and fighting for something. Did Barbara Lee... Uh, not our Barbara Lee from the Foundation, but Barbara Lee in Congress. Did she do a good thing or a bad thing in being the only vote against allowing the president unfettered power to spend as much money as he wanted on this war? She made an eloquent speech. There are people all over the country that ask me, did you know Barbara Lee? Now, we served in the state assembly together, and as I said, she's now in the Congress from Oakland. The only vote, 434 to 1. I went to to Taiwan the week after that and, and to Tokyo. It was actually in Tokyo that this happened. I thought that there was such a striking parallel with Jeanette Rankin, who uh -huh. was the first congresswoman, and in World War I, she voted against the, the war credits, and she was the only congresswoman, and right. she was a woman, and this happened again. And the students, this was a bilingual institution, one of them raised her hand and said, will you write the names of both those women on the board? And I thought that was wonderful. It brings tears to my eyes, I tell you, because she's been excoriated. And there's even a woman who, from the Green Party, in her area, who served very briefly in the state assembly after Barbara left, mm -hmm. who is now running against her as a turned into a Democrat person and her website is called dumpbarberlee.com. Oh. Well, we are all thinking we're going to smother that woman in blankets. You know, I mean, it's just so wrong. It, the, um, I actually was speaking with someone today who told me that uh, a legislator, a woman legislator from another state, who told me that uh, after that vote, and I have to confess that had I been in the Congress, I would not have voted with Barbara I would have been mm -hmm. voting with the other votes on this issue. Um, but uh, but this woman told me that after that vote, her husband, 
who does not agree with the position that Barbara Lee took, emailed her and mm -hmm. said, I want you to know how much I admire mm -hmm. the fact that you stood up there given 434 votes on the other side and you spoke and you stood for what you believed in. And so I think, I'm saying that to you because I think that there are people around the country who would have voted on the other side, sure. don't agree with her position, but are letting her know well, it's that they consider thing. it a, a very courageous. But it sort of makes my point yes. about integrity. Yes. You are given a responsibility and also I think you're cut a great deal of slack because what you have, and this is what we say to each other in our legislature, what you have is your vote. You don't owe it to anybody. You don't owe it to a colleague. You don't owe it to the governor. In some cases, you don't even owe it to your constituents. You don't owe it to anybody. You vote yes or no. You don't get a beach the hell out of me button on the floor. Mm -hmm. You make your decision. And you are in the final vote. You have to be decisive. And you have to decide which side are you on in this particular issue. Are you uh, in favor of this bill or against this bill? And no matter which way you go, if you truly believe in what you do, and not excoriating the other side, but your own vote, that is integrity, and people will appreciate it. Who would have thought that telling the truth would be considered a virtue for a politician? And yet that's what I found. Yeah. Well, you are so yeah. respected. And now you must do it as Ruth Bader Ginsburg would do it, mm -hmm. without making it sound like, you know, you're great and they're not. Right. Or that there's something wrong with them necessarily. Right. Um, this but is, but this you is, have to also have a set of principles. Yeah, I think, um, and, I, and I think it's part of what makes, and I don't want you to think, you're, to swallow your hand or anything, but it's part of what okay. makes you, <laughs> I was going to make that, uh, I was going to put on the record uh, the fact that you were voted by that group of people, because those are the people who know, staff in the legislature, your colleagues in the legislature, and the, and the <laughs> state house <laughs> reporters. To vote someone as the most intelligent and the person with the most integrity, it's just extraordinary and you deserve all the congratulations and well, gratitude of people for you being know, a person like that. But I just want to, I want to take it somewhere yes, for a minute and then come back with what you want to say about it. And that is that um, part, you're not just a legislator, you're not just elected to office, you're effective. And Part of that is what you're talking about now. It's not part of it. It's, a, it's so much of it. And that is that you're respected by your colleagues. You get along with them, whether you agree with them or you don't agree with them. You don't vote against your, you vote yay or nay, nay on where you stand. Um, but I'll bet you don't make the other side feel stupid or evil. Well, or but they don't vote with me anyway. And some of my colleagues don't vote with me. They will say, um, oh, you know, I really respect you, Sheila, but I can't be with you on this one. So it isn't that you get to be effective because you're respected. However, there are other aspects. First of all, people, when they're wavering, will be more likely to go with you because they have respect for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they're wavering, they'll be more likely to go with you because they know you'll never lie to them. And what you've told them about your bill is the whole truth about the bill, and they won't get in trouble when they go home for voting for it except for what was really in it, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Sure. Um, that part is very important in terms of telling the truth. But effectiveness is something else as well. It has to do with compromising without sacrificing the principle of a piece of legislation. Right. And sometimes, like all people, I start out with a big piece and end mm -hmm. up with a little piece. Sometimes it gets watered down and I have my toe in the door and I bring it back in a couple of years and you know we mm -hmm. keep going. Sometimes I bury something that might turn out to be very important in a bigger bill, and people don't know that it actually completely overturned a United States Supreme Court case okay. on, you know, interpreting the ADA and making California's version so much stronger that you can be protected if you have cancer, which you can't now, let's say, under mm. the ADA. And sometimes people go, I didn't know that was in there. And you say, well, but doesn't it make sense that you don't want someone fired because they develop cancer? I mean, really, do you have trouble with that? Oh, no, no, that's right. So you can be effective by telling the truth, by, you know, sliding something under the radar. Being clever. Listen, <laughs> when you have an energy crisis, you'd be amazed at the number of things you can slide in under the radar that have to do with civil rights. 
<laughs> you can be effective if you know what your agenda well, no. is and you stay on target. Mm -hmm. right? you, have to have great, you have to have great staff. Mm -hmm. I, my staff's been with me from the very beginning. And I have not a very, very big staff, but the quality of the, my people in Sacramento that work on these bills uh, and the quality of my district office staff in terms of how they deal with and serve people in our communities um, I get calls literally every day from people saying, I just wanted you to know that someone's on your staff is so wonderful. You know, she, I thought, I was at my wit's end, my mother wasn't getting her social security, it's a federal problem, I couldn't get any help, and I just called your office thinking, well, maybe I can get some help, and she just got her check, and it's only been a week. And I said, you know, <laughs> and that kind of work is very important, but you can't be effective without a great staff. How big a staff do you have? Um, counting my committee, which is the Natural Resources Committee in the Senate, mm -hmm. and two people who work for my select committee on international trade and its impact on state mm -hmm. legislation, um, 17, in the district and in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. Two of them are part-time. Uh, but it's, it's not a lot, uh, actually, compared to the work we do. Because I can bring right. 50 bills uh, in every two-year session. Mm -hmm. I'm not always that stupid, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, given all of this, and given your enthusiasm for what you're doing, how would you assess what's really hard about it at this point? What do you think the big challenges are for you as you go in or into the continuing session in the Senate? Um, first of all, it's very lonely. It's like going away to college and you come back to your family and you can't really explain to them what you're going through. <laughs> and they think you're very different. Mm -hmm. um, you go away from home every week and you stay in a foreign city. Now, it's sort of fun in a way because you make some of the best friends of your life in the legislature. And, you know, we go to dinner, we go to movies, mm -hmm. and it sounds like fun, but it's hard. Yes. You're ripped away, really, from your regular life. Um, secondly, if you care a lot about things, there's just going to be a lot you're not going to be able to get or succeed at mm -hmm. in terms of the legislation mm -hmm. or the budget. Mm -hmm. um, it can be frustrating. Now, I said yesterday my definition of an optimist is a person who knows how terrible the world can be and therefore is never disappointed. And I have to say, that's true. Mm -hmm. It allows me to not expect too much. Now, I don't expect the worst, but I don't necessarily expect that everyone will always act well. And to some extent, it helps me to keep calmer I don't get mad at absolutely everybody that doesn't vote for my bills or, mm -hmm. you know, use up a lot of energy that way. But that's very hard. Mm -hmm. When you say, don't you understand, 5,000 women are going to lose their child care if we don't help them. And people say, oh, well, you know, it's a lot of money in my district, my district, my district. So that part, that part is hard. Mm -hmm. Other people say campaigning is hard. For me, it's not. I love mm -hmm. it. I'm a, I'm a gregarious person mm -hmm. and an extrovert. Uh -huh. And so I love going into a group of uh, senior citizens or, you know, a third grade class. Or to me, it's a privilege. You'd never get invited mm -hmm. to such a thing, <laughs> you know, and you got to kind of do it uh -huh. while you can. And frankly, I love raising money mm -hmm. because I never thought it was for me. I raised money for the California Women's Law Center when we founded it. I raised money for the Sojourn Shelter. And now I'm raising money for me, but I'm an agenda. I'm not a, it's not like I get to buy a car and drive to Mexico, you know, I mean, it's not for me. And fortunately, people really understand that. They're investing in you like an agenda. It's like Barbara Boxer, when she ran the first re-election that she had, she had a fundraising campaign called A Thousand Points of Loot. <laughs> and we were it. it. And people came out of the woodwork. Uh -huh. And you know, they always predict, oh, Barbara, she's behind in the polls. Oh, Barbara, she's going to lose. And it is hard because uh -huh. people really excoriate her for being a good woman. But boy, I'll tell you, out come the people with the $20 checks. And uh -huh. out come the people with the volunteering. And out come the people, you know, that just vote for her. And every single election, people say, wow, she sure won by a big margin. How did that happen? Well, it's because real people believe in her and real people want to give her money and fortunately I'm an ideological candidate as well and therefore people really want to give me money it's not a lot but it's a lot of people mm -hmm. and I spent a million and a half on my last primary but I raised it a million and a half on the primary just on the primary well the primary was is the election the, election. the Senate mm -hmm. the Senate district is 
um, safely democratic. Mm -hmm. democratic, so you needed it all for the primary. Yeah. Is there a women's political community in California? Because oh, yes. when you talk about Senator Barbara Boxer, and of course this Senator Dianne Feinstein, yes. and you've sent a number of wonderful women to the United States Congress, yes. and there are women in the legislature, yes. is there a community? Is there a connectedness? I mean, do we all love each other? Well, I wouldn't say love each other. Okay, but, but I would I, say yes. You would not, say yes to Okay, that. not all of us, let's say. <laughs> I mean, we're, some of us just like each other. And I have to confess, people always say about me, oh, cool, you like every movie, you like every person you ever met, you know, you have no discernible taste at all. <laughs> and it is true, because I tend to think it's one of those optimistic things, like, well, what did you expect? So-and-so, you know, is a grandmother, she never finished high school, now she's in the legislature. Okay, what she's doing her best. What did you expect? Well, she's not going to be so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Um, this is the recipe for being married. Well, it kind of is. Yeah. <laughs> but it's better, isn't it, to settle into, unless you're really unhappy. I mean, there's always mm -hmm. a sort of a, you should excuse the expression, a should level, you don't want to go below. Um, there is a women's political community among electeds, uh, certainly. We know each other. There are activists um, that we know. Uh, there is a large support network all around the state women's groups and organizations in every town. Uh, the same with gay and lesbian groups. I mean, they just spring up. They're not all political, but they turn political when one of theirs, you know, is running. I mean, you could have the Gay Rodeo Cowboys Club, and they'll have a fundraiser for so-and-so, you know, that's running mm -hmm. now for the mm -hmm. assembly. Do you credit the any of the real success in numbers uh, to the fact that there is connectedness? Which comes first, that there is this community? In other words, there are only, well, now there are three states in the United States with two women senators representing them in Washington. Mm -hmm. California being the first of those three to have two women senators. We were so excited. Yeah. And you've got a large contingent of women in the Congress. I know you. It's a big state. Nonetheless, I would say California is a success story for women in politics. Do you credit the fact that there is this connectedness, this women supporting women or women's community? Yes, in a lot of cases I do. You do? Yes, in a lot of cases I do. But also that the establishment, the party, sees women as having the ability to be successful candidates, and they also will weigh in. They rarely say these days, gee, she's a woman, maybe she can't take this seat. It's more about, well, he was a city council member and she's you know, a school teacher. We're not sure. Let's see where the endorsements fall uh -huh. kind of thing. Let's see if she's got the fire in the belly. Let's uh -huh. see if she really wants it. So you're less worried about what we're seeing as a kind of leveling off trend each year or each election. The numbers would go up 1%, 2%. Now they're not looking so good. No, but I'm worried you about overall, it. you're worried. But there Let's is no such that. thing as taking anything like that for granted. Mm -hmm. How were the numbers going to keep growing and keep growing and keep growing? We have to continue to find people. I think in term limited states, for instance, mm -hmm. it's constant roiling. And so we have to find candidates constantly. But for instance, in California, there are a number of progressive legislators, a small number, that I am the central email person for. And we've identified three candidates that we wanted to pick the most progressive candidates in a Democratic primary for an open seat and help them because we want more progressives. Well, guess what? They're all women. Mm -hmm. Now, not all the progressive candidates are women. We're looking at a couple of guys, too. But the first three that this group picked, and the people who are working with us, the environmentalists, mm -hmm. labor, etc., not necessarily women's groups, that's the ones they picked, too. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting to me because, but it takes a certain amount of mentoring. I mean, I call one of these women and say, hi, I've heard you're running for the seat. This is Sheila Kuehl. And she said, how did you ever hear of me? Because they all think they're in a little town, you know, running for a little thing. They have no idea that there's this big spotlight on all of these races where they just think, oh, I think I'll run for something. I didn't know. I didn't know Willie was helping somebody else and then stopped because he saw me raising a bazillion dollars and said, maybe she can do it, you know. I didn't know people were watching. I didn't know I'd been assigned a big brother to talk to me. I thought it was just, you know, a friend who happened to be in the legislature, whatever. No one understands that there's this network when they're first running. 
and in a way it's good that they don't understand because otherwise they're going to be like, oh my God, my race is so important, I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, I, uh, we are running out of time, but I would like to say I know that you were term limited in the Assembly after six years and now you're in the Senate and we hope you're going to stay there until the ripe age, I think of 67 <laughs> it is, when you'll be at the end of whatever terms you're allowed to have there and I certainly would expect you to be there at least that long. Um, but after that, you're a phenomenon, and uh, I hope your plans are to stay on the public stage and to do more uh, of what you've been doing in being an inspiration and a guiding light, really, and encouraging other people and fighting for justice at the same time. So I'm waiting to hear that they announce you as Queen of California. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't, uh, it's a good question because the, uh, the same initiative that uh, put term limits into effect also um, cut out any retirement for legislators. And so it's an economic problem for me, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, if once I'm termed out, I suppose I could run for another office because it pays us 100 or 120,000 a year, and um, although I doubt that's going to go up for a very long time. You could and go back on the stage in the well, series on plan. women in politics. But listen, that's my plan, Great. is to get a series. To do the Linda Hunt judge part, you know what I mean, <laughs> oh. the crappers or whatever, um, oh. because they pay you so much more money, and at least you have some retirement from SAG. And what an audience! Yes. What a size audience! What a but platform! You know, the thing that I've learned, Ruth, and it's certainly the same thing you've learned. You never know. You just mm -hmm. never know. You never know. Well, thank you for talking with us. Well, it was thank wonderful. you. It was my pleasure. Thanks for asking right. me.